Namaste. So in the last episode, we introduced the idea of the unity of the Vedic tradition and the Buddha's teaching. And we brought up some historical examples to show how they are really not two different things. They're simply two different views of the same thing. And I want to make the point again that both the Vedic teaching and the Buddha's teaching are languages. They're not anything absolute in themselves. How can words be absolute? <laughs> words are always relative. That's why language changes over time. And that's one of the problems in spiritual life, that words don't mean the same now as they did when these ancient books were written or spoken. So we have to decode these messages and we have to understand them according to our contemporary language. And that's very difficult because our modern terminology doesn't include so many of the concepts and states that are described in the Shastras and the Suttas. But this unity of Vedic and Buddhist teachings is going to be the main theme of this uh, channel from now on, and we're going to approach it in all kinds of different ways, uh, beginning with the next series, which is going to be on emptiness, shunyata, which appears as a term in both traditions and which is discussed extensively in them. Yes, I know, Westerners have a hard time even conceiving of emptiness. But that's very simple. The reason for that is you are in Dvaita Vada. You are in the dualistic view where I am different from you <laughs> and I am also different from Brahman. So because we conceive ourselves as individuals, when we even think about emptiness, nothingness, or Brahman, which is pretty much the same thing, we become terrified. It feels like death. It feels like we're going to lose our precious individuality and just merge into the whole, the one, huh? the undifferentiated. Well, what's so bad about that anyway? Because in the process, you also lose all suffering, all problems, all ignorance, and so on. So those things that give us pain do so because we exist as a separate individual. And both the Vedic and the Buddha's teachings say that at the root, there is no such thing as an individual. <laughs> but a lot of people are in denial about it. A lot of people are stuck in a dualistic point of view. And why is that? Well, a long time ago, we're not really not that long ago, we did a, a large number of episodes on the Chatur Darshanam, the four views. And just to recap that briefly, the beginning view is Dvaita Vada. Dvaita means duality, that I am an individual separate from the universe and so on. Then the next higher level, oh, and the yoga for this level, duality, is Karma Yoga. So the next level is Vishishta Dvaita. Vishishta Dvaita means qualified non-duality. That we understand that God is non-dual, huh? but we can't reach that directly. Well, maybe some far in the future time we'll be able to realize it, but not right now. <laughs> and this is the basis of Bhakti Yoga. 
That is not ordinary rule-based bhakti yoga, but spontaneous, loving bhakti yoga, where one realizes ultimately, I and God are the same. When that happens, one graduates to the next stage, the third stage, vivarta vada. Vivarta means appearance. And so in this stage, one realizes that the world and the individual self are simply appearances. And this is the stage of Raja Yoga or meditation, and like taught by the Buddha. And in the final stage, Ajata, one realizes that the world and the individual self were never born. That's what Ajata means, unborn. That which is unborn can never die. So this is recognized in both the Vedic and the Buddha's teachings. I don't want to say Buddhism, and I don't want to say Hinduism, for the, both for the same reason, that those are mass religious teachings, and they are stuck in the lower one or maybe two stages at the most. But when we talk about Vedanta, and when we talk about the Buddha suttas, they are in the higher two stages. Now I want to show you something very interesting. Remember, we talked about Paticca Samuppada and its relationship with the Four Noble Truths. That the Noble Truth of Suffering pertains to the person who is grasping, who is holding on to life and consequently becoming this and becoming that and taking birth as this and that, which of course leads to suffering and death. But when that person becomes further advanced, they become aware of the noble truth of the cause of suffering. And they gradually work their way back up the ladder of causes until they realize, holy cow, I'm doing this to myself out of ignorance. I'm creating the sankara, the ontic commitments, the promises of being and becoming that lead me to develop consciousness, name and form, which is the mind, the senses, and so on. Now, when a person becomes even more advanced, they say, okay, I'm done with all this. I'm going to get on the path to enlightenment. And the fourth noble truth is the truth of the path to the end of suffering, the Eightfold Noble Path. And then finally, they reach the last four stages, which is the noble truth of the end of suffering. Now, in the Buddha's preaching, they are uh, one, two, three, four, as numbered here. But in fact, a person grows through the lower stages of the path, the eight steps of the Eightfold Path, and then they realize it and get the fruits of that path in the last four stages. So that's what's shown here. Now, amazingly enough, this has an exact correlation with the Chatur Darshanams. When a person first starts in religion, dualistic religion, Dvaitavada, they are in the stage of dualistic consciousness, thinking that they're an individual and not being able to see anything different from that. But then, once they advance to Vishishta Dvaitavada, they work their way up the line of cause and effect until they realize, oh, I'm ignorant. <laughs> I have to do something about this to get out of it. And so then the third level, Vivartavada, which consists of meditation and the preparation for meditation. And that's the path, the eightfold path, the eight stages, the eight stages of yoga, and so forth. And finally, they reach Ajatavada, which is the realization of non-duality. So we see, amazingly enough, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence and relatedness, a, a lawful, uh, non-coincidental 
duplication of structure at the highest levels of both teaching. Now, why does it have to be on such a high level? Because people on the lower levels cannot understand non-duality. They can only understand duality. So, since the Chatur Darshanam in, involve the stages of Vivartavada and Ajatavada, which are both based on non-duality, the ordinary person cannot comprehend them. That is why the dualistic religious cults, sectarian religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism, deny the reality of the higher stages. This happens to me all the time. I was just in Sri Lanka. And of course, when I go to Sri Lanka, like when I go to anywhere, I dress in the religious garb that's appropriate for that culture. And so I was wearing the white sarong and the white wraparound, similar to a monk, but white colored instead of red. Because I don't want to be considered a monk. I don't want to be subject to all those rules. Eh. But anyway, people would ask me almost everywhere I went, are you a Buddhist? Because I had shaved my head. I was wearing the clothes, the uniform. And I, I would say, no, no, I'm not a Buddhist. Well, what are you? They would say, I would say, I'm a Buddha. <laughs> There is a class of Buddha that, who become enlightened independently without being in direct association with a Buddha. <laughs> They're called independent Buddhas. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I said, I'm an independent Buddha. And they'd look at me like, oh, come on, you can't, that's not possible. They would just simply refuse to believe it. They were in utter and complete denial. But wait a minute, what is the aim of the Buddha's teaching? Isn't it to produce Buddhas? So if somebody becomes a Buddha, isn't that a good thing? And it's the same in India. In India, I dress as a sannyasi. I've taken the initiation, I know the mantras and everything. So, then people ask me, are you a Hindu? And I say, no. <laughs> I'm not a Hindu. I'm a Jnani. And just like the Buddhists who can't accept that I could be a realized Buddha, an independent Buddha, these people can't accept that I could be a realized Jnani even though their own scriptures say that anybody can become a jnani and that a jnani has no special way of behaving or acting, that he can be or act in any way according to his worldly karma, but be completely liberated on the inside. But they don't want to believe that. Even though, for example, uh, one gentleman gave me an initiation into a very high mantra, and in, I mastered the mantra in about a month and got all the realizations and told him about them, even though he hadn't told me about them. I told him about them. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's it. You got it. I said, okay, so I'm self-realized, right? Well, <laughs> he can't really accept it. He can't accept it because, number one, I'm a Westerner. And number two, I don't act like some kind of big religious muckety-muck. I'm just an ordinary guy who happens to be self-realized. But you can't tell that from the outside. Sure, there are a lot of people who put on a big act and then they claim to be gurus or whatever. And they fool a lot of people. But they could never explain what I just explained to you about how the Buddha's path and the Vedic path have an exact correspondence at the highest levels. They could never see that for themselves. 
and they certainly could never explain it to others. So how do you account for the fact that I'm able to do that? <laughs> I didn't read it in a book. See, that's the thing. So people don't understand. When you attain self-realization, you can access views that nobody else has ever seen or heard before that are completely new. And yet, when you think about it and analyze it, it's got to be true. You can't find any argument against it. And in indeed, in the, uh, what is it now, going on eight years on this channel, nobody has ever been able to successfully argue against any of the teachings, any of the points that I've made here. So this is the thing. I arranged my life in such a way as to be able to reach the top of the mountain. And I reached it from the Buddha's side, even though I didn't, <laughs> so funny, I didn't really know the Buddha's teaching. I didn't have the background, but I had a good teacher. So I reached. And then, just to verify it, I went, climbed down the other side, and then reached it again from the Vedic point of view. Reached the same realization, the same, the same top of the mountain. To verify, just to, to uh, clear for myself that this is the real thing, and that all major paths lead to the same realization. That is the basis of the unity of Vedanta and the Buddha's teaching. And that is going to be the platform on which we base all our further work. So, Om Tat Sat, Buddha Saranai. <laughs>